Um, I'm somebody, I'm from Kenya. I grew up uh, in a very arid part of Kenya. Uh, my parents were at that time working for the government of Kenya. Um, and in my early days, basically, there weren't any schools where we grew up because it was a very remote part of, uh, of Kenya, on the border with Somalia and Ethiopia. And uh, it was basically uh, learning from the local communities, running around with the nomads, uh, learning local languages, and uh, that sort of set me up um, to appreciate better different cultures, different circumstances, different types of livelihoods. Um, and uh, from there, I just moved on and uh, managed to go to school later on. Um, my father and mother joined the UN. They were international civil servants. Um, that opened up for us opportunities then to go to university. Uh, went back to Kenya, worked, trained as a forester, University of Aberdeen in Scotland. So a very different environment to where I'd grown up. Um, but uh, loved the Scots. Uh, the <laughs> their customs, their passion for life, for, for dialogue. And um, went back to Kenya, worked uh, in, uh, in uh, the government there and also with uh, international agencies. And uh, then went to the Amazon to do my doctoral degree. So a very different type of environment again, from the very dry deserts and semi-arid areas of Africa to the humid uh, rainforest of South America. Uh, worked there for half a dozen years or so and then went to the University of Cornell as a professor in upstate New York. So this was frigid in the winter, minus 20 sometimes. <laughs> so that was uh, somebody who was facing climate <laughs> in a different sense. It was changing for me personally but it brought home to me the appreciation of, of just how important climate is and the kind of impact it had on a personal life. Then from there on, joined the World Bank uh, because I wanted to have more um, interaction and, and the possibility of dialogue with policymakers, both at the international levels as well as the national levels. It's very interesting. Uh, in the World Bank, you know, uh, we we have very very deep and, and constant dialogue with our partners in in, in countries. And, and as you know, the the bank works essentially in development. It's not a, a regular bank that lends money to individuals. We work directly with governments, and so we listen carefully to what our stakeholders say to us. And when I say stakeholders, I don't just mean ministers and, and governors in, in countries, but, uh, but we also listen to what communities have to say. And this is something the bank uh, sticks very rigorously to. It, it sort of hears or, or tries very hard to listen to the whole range of stakeholders so that we have a better understanding of what the issues are, what the local needs are, and, what, and, and what, how we can help. And so this is... Uh, we began to hear, in, in, uh, when I joined the bank in, in 2003, uh, soon after that, you know, many of our clients were beginning to express alarm about uh, what was happening to their food systems, agriculture, what was happening to some of the infrastructure uh, investments that had been made in terms of extreme event, uh, rainfall, uh, extreme drought type uh, impacts. And uh, we, uh, in, as a scientist, I'm not a climate scientist, I have to say that up front uh, trend, as, a, as I mentioned, in forestry, and my PhD was in soil science. Um, it, it became clear to me that certainly climate had a pretty major impact. So we began to take a hard look at the climate science and uh, realized that, you know, we needed to sort of get a, uh, a handle on what was the latest in terms of what the science was saying. And this was 2012 when we started to, to sort of conceptualize this idea. Um, it was clear that the IPCC, the International Panel, was not going to have their next report ready for a few more years, and we decided uh, to approach the Potsdam Institute of, 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 of Climate, uh, you know, and uh, they were the ones who agreed to sort of help us to, to put together a, a synthesis of the latest science so that we could then use that uh, almost immediately in our dialogue with, with our partners in developing countries. Um, uh, there's a personal story to it because, as you know, the PIC uh, Potsdam Institute is led by Professor John Schollenhuber and by 
chance at, a, at, a, at an international meeting many, many years before that. I was sitting at a breakfast table in, in Oxford at the university there and this gentleman came and, and sat opposite me and we talked and I didn't know who he was and, and uh, finally discovered he was uh, Professor Sean Huber um, and we said uh, uh, goodbye and left and uh, several years later I was in a plane somewhere traveling and I looked across and there was uh, John Charles Huber sitting across the aisle from me. So we started, uh, we continued the dialogue we'd had earlier at, at Oxford and, and again we said goodbye and left and uh, when we then decided at the bank to sort of uh, take a hard look at this, I thought of John Charles Huber again and approached him and he's, he was kind enough to to offer the, the, the institution, you know, the, the resources of the institution to help us to put this report together very quickly. It was put together in almost uh, six to seven weeks um, and uh, it sort of transformed uh, the way we were able to sort of shape the dialogue because I recall when we launched the report um, uh, within about a week, uh, the that storm Sandy hit New York uh, and, uh, you know, Michael Bloomberg, the mayor there, sort of uh, was lamenting the fact that New York was unprepared for a storm of that magnitude and the impacts of that uh, storm. Um, and when that report came out, it seemed to resonate with the messages and everybody's attention. We had over 20 million hits in 24 hours on that. It was quite extraordinary, I think, uh, the impact we had uh, and the timing of that report. Well, uh, it showed, it sort of showed us very quickly that uh, uh, based on sort of the emissions trajectories that, uh, uh, and I'm talking of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, it, it was clear that, uh, you know, the, we were, we were going to go past two degrees centigrade, which is this sort of consensus as to beyond which uh, you would have dangerous climate change. Uh, and uh, all indications are that we were heading by 2100 or the end of the century to a plus four degree world. And uh, uh, even at 0.8 degrees centigrade warming, which is where we are now relative to pre-industrial times, you know, uh, an increase of, uh, of temperature, of average temperature across the world of 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade is not going to be a picnic. And this is a, a term I often use because as our stakeholders are pointing out to us, the, the, the impacts were very large. And the four degree work uh, report in essence sort of confirmed that it sort of uh, laid out these uh, significant impacts on food systems. Uh, our agricultural yields were likely to be impacted significantly because of uh, extreme event uh, uh, frequencies, extreme rainfall or extreme heat or extreme drought. Uh, that uh, came out uh, strongly. What was particularly disturbing is that uh, the impacts in, in the lower latitudes around the tropics were going to be more than uh, at higher latitudes. Um, and uh, clearly the southern hemisphere was going to be disproportionately impacted relative to the northern hemisphere. Uh, and this uh, essentially touches uh, the, our partners that we are working with. So it is the developing countries that are going to suffer dispropor disproportionately from the, the climate change and especially the poor. And our goals in the bank now is to, to sort of tackle, uh, really eliminate extreme poverty, people living below a dollar 25 cents uh, a day. That shouldn't, shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be the case, really. And, and to, to enhance shared prosperity across the world. And, uh, and there was no way we were going to be able to achieve those goals, let alone uh, uh, the fact that you know, maybe 33 uh, decades of development that had already been achieved was likely to be rolled back uh, by this impact. So, uh, food systems, uh, tropical biomes, uh, uh, rainforests uh, seem to be threatened uh, because of these uh, extreme temperatures. Uh, the coastal zones, uh, really, uh, there was no way, you know, that uh, based on sea level rise, based on the frequency of extreme events that were projected in the four degree world, that uh, the increasing urban population in developing countries, largely coastal, was not going to be impacted quite severely. And uh, the, uh, the other one that we were really concerned about was the, the glaciers, the tropical glaciers, as you know, in Latin America, in the Andean region, 90, over 99% of the glaciers are in, in the Andes, are the tropical glaciers. And they are very, very important for, for a range of uh, hydropower, irrigation, and ecosystem services as well, you know, um, keeping water flows to the... To the thing. So we, those were the key uh, findings that uh, were beginning to emerge. They were pretty alarming for us. 
uh, although we, it was a four degree world that we were looking at, you know, what the likelihood of that, uh, we were particularly alarmed at the trajectory to four degrees and, and even at two degrees, uh, it's really going to be very difficult. Uh, one very remarkable uh, conclusion from that first report was that even at 1.5 degrees centigrade warming, it was uh, unlikely that uh, more than 10 percent of the coral reefs around the world would, would, would survive based on uh, ocean temperatures, based on acidification of the ocean uh, and, and, and storm events uh, from that. So the, the, the first report was a global snapshot, if you like, of what, what was going to happen. The, we did a deeper dive in the second Turn Down the Heat report, focusing on Africa, South Asia, and East Asia, and the Pacific. Uh, and that one focused very quickly on, on the fact that uh, the urban, especially in South Asia, East Asia, and the Pacific, where you have a large urban population, uh, in, in East Asia, a lot of that population is living below five meters above sea level. And uh, they are extremely vulnerable then to sea level rise and, and increased intensity of tropical uh, cyclones that were, were projected for East Asia and the Pacific. Um, uh, it coupled with that was the Pacific Islands, of course, the small islands that are this extremely vulnerable uh, to sea level rise and warming. Uh, the South Asia context was, uh, was also alarming because there we were finding that uh, food systems, the monsoon systems, could be impacted. And monsoons, as you know, are, are vital for the agriculture of South Asia. Uh, the, the, the effects would be disproportional, uh, whether it's North India or South India or Central India. Uh, one of the uh, suggestions, or not suggestions, the conclusions from that second report was that wetter might get, uh, wet might get even wetter and dry might get even drier. And, and so, you know, uh, communities and stakeholders would be faced with the with the with the decision, uh, tough decisions on where, what to grow, how to grow it, uh, when to grow it, uh, what would happen to energy systems, what would happen to food systems, what would happen to water supply, all of those were, were a major issue. And uh, currently, populated areas would be extremely, uh, you know, impacted by that, by those changes. Uh, the, the Africa, we were seeing again uh, major impacts on food systems. Uh, corn, which is a major crop, uh, a food crop in, in Africa, was likely to be impacted severely in terms of productivity, in terms of the area where corn is currently grown. Um, uh, biome shifts were beginning to, to, to emerge in the, in the projections whereby some of the grassland savannas might change to a more tree-like savanna, and that would impact a lot of the grazing systems uh, that uh, communities and nomadic uh, communities uh, do, uh, develop, uh, uh, depend upon not to mention the wildlife that uh, you know, is an important part of the economies of, of, of many African countries. Uh, that, that coupled with some of the rainfall projections as well, being uh, Eastern Africa, for example, getting 20 to 30 percent more rainfall, um, although at first sight might seem beneficial uh, when you compare it to the events when they have, uh, in years when they've had either El Enso, El Nino, La Nina impacts, where you have that kind of rainfall increase, you see that much of the infrastructure is damaged, uh, crops are lost, et cetera. So what that says to us is that the landscapes are not really ready for uh, taking on excess rainfall. The landscapes are not ready for taking uh, or for an uh, absence of rainfall. And so uh, you know, what seems is an advantage on deeper analysis seems to suggest that we need to do work uh, in fixing our landscapes, making sure that we have the right kinds of uh, infrastructure in place, et cetera. The third report was focused mainly on Latin America, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and, uh, uh, and, and, and there we begin to see that, again, uh, uh, in, in looking at Latin America, major impacts on, the, on rainforest. The Amazon is a major one. Uh, although the earlier climate models had suggested uh, rainforest dieback, uh, the current models are suggesting that th that's unlikely in the sense that uh, there is some resilience inherent in the rainforest, but we're beginning to see degradation of the rainforest. That's different. And over time, if that degradation uh, that's uh, natural through natural processes, uh, changes in rainfall regimes, extension of dry seasons, uh, and then when you couple that with human influence, uh, deforestation, road building into the Amazon, uh, extension of pasture systems, 
uh, that could actually make the forest vulnerable to severe degradation. So that way you're losing carbon, you're increasing emissions from the carbon uh, from the forest, uh, and you're making the forest more vulnerable to fires, etc. So you know that uh, that is currently holds. The Brazilians are, are taking a hard look at this from a science perspective, uh, and they're coming up with newer data that seems to confirm some of those uh, findings from the report. Uh, the, the Andean situation uh, was brought more into focus as well, so the glaciers beginning to change. Um, some of the other research that colleagues are doing in the region suggests that much of our coffee systems, that you know, if you like coffee, uh, we would have uh, we would have much less area suitable for coffee. Colombia, Costa Rica, Central America. Um, that's uh, not a very good finding because uh, much of the coffee systems are smallholder systems. And if the smallholder farmers are unable to grow coffee, what else are they going to grow? Um, coupled with that, uh, the health issues. Uh, this is, has emerged across all the reports is that as temperature goes up, uh, vectors for disease uh, might change in terms of their ranges, etc. And in the coffee systems, in a recent data set that compared Ethiopia with Colombia, uh, they were projecting that, for example, malaria and dengue might start to appear in ranges, in altitudinal ranges, but they don't exist at the moment. So even above 2,000 meters above sea level in, in Latin America, you might start to see, you know, malaria, which is unusual. Uh, and the population there has no no experience of this. So it would again require governments to, to begin to put in place the health systems and, and the monitoring systems to deal with that uh, issue if that were to happen. So I mean, I, this, this shows, I think, some of the interactions between the climate and livelihoods and ecosystems. I think that uh, you know, we need to, to be very alert to and, and be advising our, our partners in developing countries how, what are the options for them to, to begin to build resilience uh, to this change. Yeah, we, we, you know, we, uh, we were asked that question. So what is the World Bank uh, doing, uh, you know, producing reports on climate change? And, and we were asked that question internally as well when we first attempted to turn down the heat report. Um, the, the, the idea was that if we wanted, you know, to couple, we are largely seen as, uh, as, a, as an institution that advises from an economic uh, uh, perspective. But uh, the reality is that uh, we touch upon societal and ecosystem uh, issues that are fundamental uh, to e economies globally, okay? Whether they're natural resource-based, uh, mining, energy, um, timber, uh, agriculture, all of those are valuable parts and essential parts of the economy. So if there is a major driver of change in the productivity uh, of those systems, then we need to, to be able to advise from a, from a from a sense of, 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 of good science uh, and have a certain confidence. So um, when we produced the Turn Down the Heat report, it was uh, with some surprise and trepidation that it was received. Uh, I remember when we launched it, um, Bloomberg picked it up and, and tweeted it and in, a, in a positive sense because of what had just happened in terms of the impacts on New York from uh, San, uh, the storm Sandy or Sandy Storm. Um, and uh, Donald Trump picked it up and uh, also tweeted it, but uh, with a great deal of skepticism. Uh, Huffington Post picked it up and uh, Argo picked it up. And before we knew it, we had millions of, uh, uh, of, of tweets and accessions on social sites, etc. So I think um, th the next uh, uh, surprise to us was that uh, uh, the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury asked us to come in and do a briefing for them. Uh, and uh, the perception there was that uh, the report had been produced by an institution, uh, to paraphrase a member of the House of Representatives, uh, uh, that is not known for its environmental activism. And, and therefore, it was important that people start to read this. So I think the platform of the bank uh, as, as an agency that is involved in development, that is, you know, uh, actively and, 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 and thinking about, not just thinking, but uh, providing resources to, to foster development over a long period. It's not just next year, two years, we're, look, we're looking at decadal development, resilience and that, uh, economic uh, improvements. Um, is, it provides a different sort of platform that people are interested to see where we're coming from and, and how we're using science 
to inform the economic investment uh, decision making as well.